gets at least one take home message, and that is there's no such thing as magic foods. There's no such thing as magic foods, good or bad foods, there's only foods and slash micronutrients. <clears throat> so let's begin. All right, so some other goals that I have for you guys are, like I said, to learn that there's no such thing as good and bad foods, um, and then really hope you guys get the confidence and then the tools to adopt a more so macronutrient-based approach, if you haven't already, and then if you have, then just kind of solidify using what you already know. Um, and then hopefully this gets you guys more curious and inspired to learn more about nutrition, because nutrition is my favorite thing in the world. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started. So, I'm sure you guys have seen this around the internet or something like this, um, and I have a couple questions for you. So which of these meals do you think is better for weight loss and then weight gain? So here we have Panera Bread, we got looks like a sandwich, and then orange juice, or okay, premium orange juice. And then we've got McDonald's, egg white delight. McDonald's. I like the fiber on the right side. Right? I just don't like saying McDonald's. Right? <laughs> but you can't argue. So well, so what would be your choice for weight loss? If someone said, I want to lose weight, and I am torn between eating this McDonald's meal or this Panera Bread meal. Panera Bread. Okay. Here's the thing, though. So I like, like, I see some green, which I like. Maybe there's some type of vegetable on the left. So maybe I would say Panera. But at the same time, this overall energy balance right side is less. There you go. See, he touched on a really important topic, and that's energy balance. We'll get to energy balance a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, typically the the king of weight loss, weight maintenance, or weight gain is going to be energy balance. That is going to be the significant, most important thing when it comes to reaching some kind of health goal is energy balance. <clears throat> so <clears throat> down here, you can see a couple numbers that have letters attached to them, 21P, what does you know, what those mean? So here, this means this meal has 21 grams of protein, 16 grams of fat, 79 grams of carbs, and then six grams of fiber. We'll talk a little bit about all of these. So these first three are called macronutrients. Those are basically things that, uh, portions of your food that contain calories. And then fiber is another super important thing. We'll talk about that later as well. <clears throat> so what is clean eating? Clean eating is, just a dieting approach, just like the ketogenic diet, um, Atkins, it's similar to those kind of things. However, what makes it different is that people that adopt the clean eating approach focus more so on the types of food rather than uh, like calories consumed or <clears throat> things like that. So a lot of people that have a clean eating approach will consume a lot of foods that are like fruits and vegetables or things that they deem as, as clean, as healthy foods. And they'll abstain a lot of times from junk, which you know we think of like cookies, candy, pizza, things like that. So they'll just totally not have those things at all. And sometimes people even take it a step further and they'll abstain from things that are non-GMO or organic or no preservatives, things like that. Um, side rant, everything is processed. Literally every single food that you consume is processed to some degree. So just a little fun thing. Um, and also there's chemicals in pretty much all foods you eat. However, it depends on the dosage that you eat. So if you ever see like the food babes, you'll talk about, oh, this food has this and this chemical in it and this causes cancer. Yeah, but you need to eat like a ridiculous dosage to even see signs of anything. Like, okay, here's, Here's an example of, and I, I made sure I had time for this because this is a thing of passion. Um, dihydrogen monoxide has been correlated to uh, increased um, drowning. So <laughs> the, more, the more you're around dihydrogen monoxide, the more likely you are to drown. So you should avoid it, right? Because I don't want to drown. It's freaking water. Mm -hmm. It's water. But a lot of people who don't know what dihydrogen monoxide is are like, oh, we should ban it because I don't want to drown and blah, blah, blah. Just stay educated. Be curious. <clears throat> so clean eating, there are some pros to it. I'm not saying it's a totally just terrible approach because for things like typically, you know, clean eaters do get a high intake of nutrient-dense foods since they consume quote-unquote clean, healthy foods. That's going to be like your vegetables, your lean meats, uh, and just high-fiber foods. So another big thing is they get a lot of fiber, which is 
super helpful for you know, reducing uh, overall cholesterol, feeling fuller for a longer period of time, things like that. And also one thing I've noticed, because I was kind of a clean eater a uh, few years back too, um, is that you get kind of creative with your recipes. So since you can't use things like butter or you know, uh, vegetable oils and things like that, they get you know, creative on how they prepare foods and they just make a lot of weird slash sometimes tasty things. Um, however, there are some cons. Um, so you do see an increased risk of orthorexia nervosa. And what orthorexia nervosa is, is uh, as defined by the um, National Eating Disorders Association, is the fixation on consuming righteous foods. And so righteous foods are seen as like healthy foods, clean foods, things like that. Um, and you know the fixation part is just being so focused and honed in on eating that. And so when you, you know, deviate from doing that, it just kind of throws you out of whack. Um, <clears throat> And there was actually a study done on uh, individuals who uh, had a more rigid control diet and then like a more flexible control. So they would allow themselves to eat, you know, just kind of whatever they were feeling. And then there were the rigid control people who were more so, you know, fixed, had this kind of clean eating fixation. Uh, it was 188 obese, or I'm sorry, not obese, non-obese women. And what they found is that these, uh, the rigid control group was actually more likely to report symptoms of eating disorders, so such as like uh, anxiety and then, like, mood disturbances. They also had higher BMI, which BMI is a general like guideline on what your weight should be at at a certain like weight, or I'm sorry, yeah, certain weight, height, and age. So if someone has a BMI of like over 30, that means they're obese. If someone has a BMI of I think it's like 22, it's overweight. But basically, so people that you know had this rigid control were more likely to have a higher BMI, which I think is kind of crazy because you think you know the more rigid you are, the more you know weight you're going to lose, or just the more healthier you're going to be. But that just wasn't the case with the research. <clears throat> and also in the same uh, research, they also had increased uh, episodes of binging, and not only were the episodes of binging uh, more frequent, but they were also a lot more severe. So the overeating would just be a lot, they would eat a lot, like they would overeat a lot more than people who had the rigid control, the um, flexible group. <laughs> and I think it has to do with uh, a theory that was proposed in the 70s, early 80s called restraint theory. So restraint, what restraint theory says is um, when and I'm sure you all have had experience with this, is when you're told you can't do something or you can't eat something, what do you want to do? You want to do that thing. Just because, you know what, oh, screw you, I'm going to do that thing, right? Yeah, so I think that's what it has a lot to do. It's just There's a lot of psychology behind it, and I think restraint theory is a pretty good uh, explanation of why these things occur. <clears throat> Next thing is, this kind of goes with the binging and orthorexia, um, is you get a really poor relationship with food and that you kind of you start to categorize foods as like bad or good, and once you start to do that, it kind of messes with your brain a little. And so, if you do consume those foods, you start to get a little guilty, and you start to feel bad, like oh my god, I ate you know a whole thing of Oreos, or I ate this one slice of pizza. Like screw it, I'm just gonna go off my diet and just binge. You know, I lost all my progress already. Might as well. And so they. They binge and they just go on a crazy bender, and then what do they do? They feel bad again. You know, I did it again. You know what makes me feel better? Ice cream. So they have some more ice cream, and it's just a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle because of that fear aspect, because they fear food. But if you can just understand that just food is food, you don't really have that fear portion anymore. It's just oh, I just had some ice cream. Cool. Move on. <clears throat> Another thing with, just kind of one thing that I noticed with clean eating is that there really isn't a, a set definition. I know I kind of gave you one, but it's still kind of loose in what it can mean. For what clean foods can be to someone, it could be a dirty food for somebody else. Someone might see broccoli as a clean food, another person might be like, oh, it's unclean, it came from the ground, it has dirt on it. <laughs> That's just an example. I don't, I don't know if people actually say that. <laughs> and then... Clean eating also, just from what I've seen, and like I said, I was a clean eater myself too, it kind of comes at a high cost when you gotta buy like organic foods and um, 
I don't know, like organic peanut butter or um, what is it, like natural natural things and freaking coconut oil because that's the big thing right now is coconut oil. Like those things are expensive. Costs a lot of money. If you just you know stick to your fruits and vegetables and things like that that are just conventional, you can still live a healthy lifestyle, be healthy, and not you know break the bank. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about <laughs> my favorite topic myself for a little bit. Um, so at the beginning of my freshman year of college, I had a prep coach because I thought, you know what, I want to be a bodybuilder. So I'm going to be a bodybuilder. So I got a prep coach for about two and a half years um, and he put me on a meal plan, which if you don't know what a meal plan is, it's essentially a just like very rigid uh, list of foods that you eat. And so I would eat this food every single day for, man, I don't even know how long, for like a year and a half. So every single day I would eat the same food. Um, and so it's just, like I would be good all week. I would, you know, I would eat my meals all week, but then every weekend, and this is my cousin right here, he can attest to this, I would binge every week, every weekend. <laughs> we would go out and I would look, I would be Squidward. <laughs> Except there would be like a pizza here, some ice cream, some pasta, it was bad. Huh? Three ice creams each. Or three slickables each, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would consume like thousands of calories in one meal. And like I swear, it'd probably be like around 3,000 calories in one meal. And the reason why I can do this is because these foods are so palatable and not filling because they don't have fiber and things like that in them that you could just keep eating, keep eating, keep eating, and you wouldn't really get full. And so, did I make progress? I did. But that's not saying, oh, clean eating works. Eh. Reason why I made progress is because I, you know, this is the time that I had like a, I had a strict, you know, dieting program and like a strict training program. And so just through kind of refining and having like a set structure to my training nutrition was I able to make progress. And also, you know, I was younger, so I had a higher metabolism. Nah, I have a higher metabolism. I'm good. Um, but yeah, so that's why I made progress. But there were times when I would, you know, I would deviate from the meal plan during the week. And when I did that, I would get very just emotionally like distraught from that. I was like, holy crap, what'd I do? I lost the progress. And sometimes if that happened, I would kind of I would kind of go into that mode of screw it. I already, you know, I already um, messed messed up messed it up for the week, and so I would binge that day. And I'll tell myself, all right, I'll just make my, my cheat day this day and I won't do it on the weekend. About half the time, that wouldn't be the case. I would still do it on the weekend. That's because I associated the weekends with cheat days. So I think that's a really powerful thing is that you kind of get into these kind of modes where weekends equal cheat days. So for some people, it's weekend equal. Don't remember it because I blacked out. <laughs> um, and the important thing though, oh, actually one other thing too. I didn't eat with my friends and family when we would go out to places. I would bring freaking meals with me. And he can attest to that too. I would bring my stupid Tupperware things with me. Because I had, huh? <laughs> to restaurants even. Yes, to restaurants. I did that. I would bring, I would be that guy. I would, I asked, I remember one time I asked someone, like, hey, can you heat this up for me? And so he was like in the back and heated up my meal for me. <laughs> yeah, that was me. I was that guy. Um, one thing I want to say though is that I'm not saying the coach is a horrible person or anything like that because you know he has, they have had successful clients in the past. Um, I think it was just kind of the way that I decided to implement it was wrong. So I'm not gonna say he's a horrible person because he's not. He's a good guy. Moving on. There's no such thing as magic food. Magic foods. Sorry. <laughs> magic foods. Uh, or good and bad foods. All right. So what's the better approach or another approach? Um, a flexible approach. So this shifts the focus from the categories of food and the types of food that you're eating more so just to looking at things as macronutrients. And we'll talk about in a second what macronutrients are if you don't know. Um, yeah, so once again, meeting a macronutrient target based on whatever goal you have set. And I just really like this meme because it is very true. <laughs> people, would, people would ask me, be like, oh, why are you eating Reese's Peanut Butter Cup? Aren't you trying to be healthy? Yeah. You know, keeping me from eating a whole thing of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so who's a real winner here? Um, here's, a, here's a question that I get a lot. What about micronutrients? How can you, you know, have a flexible approach and still get all your micronutrients in? So those are your vitamins, your minerals, and other things like that. 
Well, the nice thing about having a flexible approach is that it's really a self-regulating system. When you have protein, carbohydrate, and fat targets that you, you know, strive to meet, you can't really go and eat like pizza, cookies, and just overload on those things because your carbohydrate and fat targets are going to be all the way up here and your protein is going to be down here. So what are you left with? Not a whole lot of foods. Maybe you know have to down like six protein shakes to get your protein back up. Who really wants to you know do that? That's not fun. <clears throat> that's not the that's not the point of it. You want to you know be able to enjoy food. That's the whole thing. <clears throat> so yeah, carbs pro, carbs fat will be high, protein low, and you're still going to be hungry because as I mentioned alluded to earlier, I was able to eat like thousands of calories of pizza and cookies and stuff because it wasn't filling. So I was keep eating, eating, eating. But then I would get full and hate myself because I just had like a giant food baby. Um, yeah, so targets can't be met on track. So just a quick refresher on what the macronutrients are if you don't know. So protein and carbohydrates both have four calories per gram. Cor protein, excuse me, is super important for cell growth and repair and not just for muscles either. Protein has so much more uh, important things that it does other than just build muscle. Uh, it also starts many processes as neurotransmitters and hormones. So that's uh, neurotransmitters and things like acetylcholine that start muscle contractions. <clears throat> and then a fun fact, I just think this is fun. Insulin is a hormone derived from amino acids, which amino acids are components of protein. So I just thought that was a fun bit. I didn't know that. Uh, carbohydrates, they are, they are the preferred source of energy by the body. Do not skip out on your carbohydrates, please. They fuel intense activity, like sprinting and heavy weightlifting. So a lot of like the, excuse me, um, a lot of things that you see people doing in the weight room, they're gonna be using their carbohydrate stores and uh, glycogen for things, for things like that. Whereas fat, that comes at nine calories per gram, and that's gonna more so fuel moderate to light activity. So it's like light jogging and running on the treadmill for a little while, that's gonna be, that's where it's gonna come from your fat. Now, does that mean that's gonna go directly towards burning body fat? Not necessarily, um, but that's just a side thing. Uh, fat is also important for transporting and um, metabolizing fat-soluble vitamins, like vitamin A, D, E, and K. So if you don't, if you have a super low fat intake, you know, it's one, gonna mess with your hormones, it's gonna kind of throw them out of whack. But then it's also not gonna, it's going to reduce your ability to absorb these fat-soluble vitamins, and then that can lead to deficiencies, which you do not want. Uh, so don't skip on fats either. The uh, next thing is fiber. So I love fiber. I'm kind of a nerd for fiber. Um, it promotes gut health and improves cholesterol by binding to cholesterol when you excrete it through the urine, which is kind of crazy, I think. Um, and then it helps with satiety as well. Satiety means just that uh, feeling of feeling full for a longer period of time. So if you ever notice like you've had like a lot of uh, brown rice or just even white rice, you feel full for a long time. You don't have to eat a lot of food after that. Um, you can go for a couple hours without it. So why does this flexible approach work? <clears throat> I found this amazing uh, pyramid here by Eric Helms. He is a um, really well-known researcher in nutrition and exercise science and he came up with this amazing pyramid called the Muscle Strength Nutrition Pyramid. Now, I know some of you may not be thinking, oh, I don't want to build muscle and get strong. You know, that's not important to me, that's fine. However, I think this pyramid can also relate to people that you know, just want to lose weight or just even want to maintain. So it ranks the most important things from uh, the bottom here all the way to the top. We got, so, um, sorry, not supplements. We got energy balance, macronutrients, micronutrients, nutrient timing, and supplements. Notice, supplements are at the top. These are not the most important things. So, that's just my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so energy balance is at the bottom. What energy balance means, it's, that's just, it's basically the relationship between energy intake and then what you put out. How many calories you use to fuel just daily activity throughout the day. Excuse me. Um, a positive energy balance is when you are consuming more than what you're putting out. A negative energy balance is when you're um, putting out more than what you're consuming. So, We'll get the actual get to that in a second. Um, one more thing, clean foods can make you fat. You can get fat off eating chicken breast, rice, and broccoli. It is possible. It's hard because there's a lot of fiber in broccoli and then protein is just another um, kind of satiating food, but it is possible. You can get fat off clean food. Don't let anyone say otherwise. 
Um, you can also get lean while enjoying food. You can, you can lose weight or you can build muscle and you know, whatever goal you have, you can do it while enjoying food, while being happy and having a good relationship with food. It is so very much possible to be able to do that. Um, and the way it works is you have, accountability, you have like an accountability factor to, to whatever your goal is, because you see it every day. You're, oh, I gotta meet you know, these macronutrient numbers and that kind of keeps you accountable. <clears throat> and then I want to talk about um, an example here of kind of why it works in action with uh, the Twinkie Diet. If any of you know, I'm sure some of you know what the Twinkie Diet is. This is a perfect example of energy balance. Okay, so there was this uh, professor named Mark Hobb. He was a professor out of Kansas State University. Um, <laughs> and he wanted to demonstrate that energy balance is the prime factor of weight loss. <laughs> and so what he did was he designed a diet for himself um, that was primarily eating Twinkies. So I think it was like three quarters of his, of his calories came from Twinkies. And then obviously he had um, a, a multivitamin just because he still needed to get vitamins in. Um, and you know, obviously Twinkie isn't a super nutrient dense food. So he had mostly Twinkies and multivitamin. Um, and so he did this experiment for about four weeks, and through that process, he lost weight. And originally, he was going to do he was going to do it there, but he kept going for I think another I think for another four weeks. And by the end of the by the end of the two months, he lost 27 pounds. And that was only because he reduced the amount of calories that he was on. But how could that be? He was eating Twinkies. Twinkies make you fat. Exactly. The calorie surplus makes you fat. Well, sorry, it doesn't make you fat, but it makes you gain weight. And if you keep staying in a calorie surplus and not increasing your activity, then yeah, you're gonna get fat. <clears throat> so I think that was just an amazing experiment done by Mark Hub. No. 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 What are you doing? No. Damn it. <laughs> huh? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! There's no such thing as magic food. <laughs> okay, so how do you do it? How do you adopt a more flexible approach um, if that's something we want to do? First off, you need to set a goal. So whether that be to lose weight, lose body fat, gain weight, build muscle, or just to maintain where you're at now because you're happy, and that's totally fine. Um, so you need to establish what you want to be because everything else is going to be based off of that. And then you want to find <clears throat> uh, what your maintenance calories are. And so I think by I think a good way of doing that is by tracking um, the uh, foods that you currently consume now. And so not changing anything yet about your diet, but just tracking what you eat on a daily basis for I would say about five to five days to about a week, um, just so you can get the weekend into. Uh, and so, yeah, and then when you do that, you know, put everything into whatever tracking app you decide to use, uh, MyFitnessPal. Um, I used to use like NutritionData.com. Um, and just track that in and then find on average how many calories you're eating a day. Because the body has a really good uh, mechanism of consuming however many calories it needs just to, just to get by. So it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna do that through, I don't know what I was saying with that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so take it on average and that will be about a good baseline of what your maintenance calories are going to be. If you're going to lose weight, how much of a, um, sorry, how much of a deficit you want to be in. I would suggest, so just so your body can get used to the um, deficit and not kind of put itself in a starvation mode and slow its metabolism, is to do it in a gradual way, so do it very slowly. Um, and through there, your body's gonna be like, all right, I can deal with this tiny little you know, loss in calories, and then it'll make up for that. Whereas, if you just drop the calories significantly, it's gonna say, holy crap, where's all the food? I'm gonna put my body, put myself in a starvation mode so you know, I don't die. It's gonna slow down the metabolism, and then you're still eating a whole lot of food, so you're gonna wait, and it's very unfortunate. Whereas, <clears throat> if you wanna gain weight, uh, generally, it's to put yourself in a surplus. And once again, do this in a gradual way so you don't get fat. 
um, next thing is to select the distribution of the macronutrients. So I would say to base that on the on your lifestyle and then just doing it for happiness. So if you're someone who likes to run, I would allocate um, not more calories from fat than carbohydrate, because carbohydrate is still going to be the leading thing that fuels our activity. However, um, I would go up higher on, we'll talk about this in a, talk about this in a, in a second, excuse me, um, go a little bit higher on this, on this range than you would someone who's not a runner. So <clears throat> what, this, what this means right here, AMDR, that's the accepted macronutrient distribution range. And these are just general guidelines on where you should allocate calories based on this um, general health. So let's say if you were to go below you know, the 45 of carbohydrate, it, are, if you go to like 44% of your calories, it's gonna go to carbohydrate. Are you gonna die? No, but if you go like significantly lower, you can have some kind of complications. So for example, your brain uses about 20% of the carbohydrates that you consume, so it's an energy hog. Um, if you don't get that much um, carbohydrates, then you're gonna start feeling very fatigued and might even go to something called ketosis. That's a little other, other thing. Um, but yeah, so set up your calories based on, you know, if you like carbohydrates, have more carbohydrates. If you like fat, have more fat. Um, protein doesn't need to be insanely high. 35 is pretty high. When I was at, um, when I was with my coach, my calories were about at 35 and it was just, it was insane how much protein I would be eating. It was ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> and then I would say to choose foods that are gonna help you be consistent with whatever uh, you know, diet approach you decide to do. So, and then just you know, to make you happy. So the beautiful thing about this is that you can choose whatever food you want and you can make it fit your, your macronutrients. If it fits your macros, that's why it's called this. Um, and the last thing would be to of what different portion sizes for food looks like. If you don't like to do that, um, I would still say do it just for a little bit until you kind of get it down. And then you can implement what's called mindful eating. Mindful eating is just a approach to just being more conscious about how much you eat and like the, the, the foods you eat and still kind of make it fit like a general range of what your macros are. So it's kind of just a more laid back approach. <clears throat> So what is the best approach? Obviously, I think it's a flexible approach, but it depends. If you like clean eating and you can be consistent with it and you don't have crazy binge episodes with it, then do it. It's totally fine. If you feel good about eating fruits and vegetables, um, pretty much only, and just eating clean foods, that's totally fine. Um, I, you know, I personally like the flexible approach because it lets me eat you know, my ice cream and stuff and still reach my goals, but that's just me. Um, I put this quote up here by Soki Lee. She's a up and coming, um, this big name in, in fitness. And I really like this because it's, it's so true. Put quite simply, the best diet for you is one that you enjoy. Yeah, you better freaking like it. Uh, you can stick to it consistently because what's the point if you can't stick to it and you're just binging all the time? And then it gets you results because there's also no point to a diet if you're not getting any results from it. <clears throat> so I just think, you know, whatever approach you want to do is totally fine. If you think flexible, flexible dieting is dumb, then you know, do, do clean eating. Just make sure that you enjoy what you're doing, you can stick to it, and then it gives you results. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then these are just some of the resources that I had. So my last bit about inspiring you guys to learn more about nutrition, you can go to some of these sources here. Um, the Natural Eating Disorder Association, that's where I found the, um, the definition. The, the definition for clean eating, PubMed, that's just a general nutrition research, research uh, website. You can find a lot of really cool, interesting things on there. Um, the ISSN.org, that's more so for like sports nutrition, so if you like things like that, um, you can go there. And then Avatar Nutrition is a uh, custom macronutrient service. It kind of like sets you up with macros based on whatever goal you have, and then it adjusts weekly. I'm not paid by them, I just really like it a lot. Um, and then Sigma Nutrition Radio and Physique Science Radio, those are more nutrition podcasts, more so on the focus of sports nutrition, just because that's my thing, that's what I enjoy. Um, and then Nutrition.gov is by the USDA, uh, and it just provides basic nutrition information if you really just need to start from the beginning.
So that's everything. Do um, you guys have any questions for me? Holy crap, I went by that fast. Any questions? Could you talk, oh, I'm just curious, that Sigma Nutrition podcast, I'm a big podcast fan, uh, what do they primarily talk about? What's in the comments? So they talk about a whole lot of stuff. There's a lot of uh, episodes that they have. Um, his name is Danny Lennon. He's a guy in the UK. And he, <clears throat> he really brings in a lot of people from all different areas of, of fitness and nutrition and even health. Like the first uh, one that I listened to just had to do on like obesity research and things like that. So it's really just a huge array of, of topics. So it's, it's really cool. I would definitely suggest listening to it. Did you get that one from Kelly and Michelle? Sigma nutrition? Yeah. No, I actually got it from, um, who was the PTD worker? Matthew? Yeah, Matt. Yeah, he actually told me about it. And then I saw later that Kelly, yeah. Yeah, she's a big on it. Yeah. Any other questions? What's like you have? My main takeaway for it would be to just be happy with what you eat. Be happy with what you eat and adopt a approach to like eating dieting that makes you happy and that helps you reach your goals. So I guess I guess the best way I would sum it up would be that quote at the at the very back at the very back part. So just stick, you know, have a have a dieting approach or have a eating approach that allows you to be happy with what you eat, um, you can stick to it consistently and it gets the results. Anything else?